We are going to share from 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 17. With the topic, visible difference. Yes, visible difference. And I'll read from here to save time. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away, and everything has been made new. Praise the Lord. This is a verse that most of us are very conversant with. Most of us are very familiar with this Bible verse. And tonight I want us to look at the difference in the lives we live before we came to Christ and the lives that we are living now that we say that we are in Christ. If the world is not able to see a visible difference in the kind of life that we live, then there is a problem with our salvation. We discover that there are many instances in the Bible where Bible characters, they had their own uh, weaknesses, they had their own shortcomings, they had their own difficulties, they had their own character, they had their own behavior. But at the end of the day, when they came in contact, when they had an encounter, when they had a one-on-one -on -one transformation with Christ, there was a difference. You know that most of us, we have different temperaments. A temperament is a kind of character, it's a kind of behavior, it's a particular pattern that we exhibit at some point in time. And that temperament can be inherited. You can inherit something from your parents. That temperament can be developed, it can come out, you can be picked up through the kind of company that we keep. If you keep companions who behave in a particular manner, before too long, you might start behaving like them. It might be in an environment where we live in. Maybe you hear they say people from this particular community, they behave like this. People from this particular area, these are their characteristics. And even in the church of Christ, you discover that these temperaments are part of it. That's why in some churches or in some groups because you think that the groups are not are, are, are made of made up of saints that's not the case the groups are made up of the same saint, the same uh, christians who go to church so the misunderstandings the small small discrepancies that you have in the day-to-day -day church is the same thing that you have in the group is the same thing that you have in the family is the same thing that you have at your workplace is the same thing that you have in school anywhere that you are called to meet people because human resource is the most difficult resource to manage so we we have a situation where maybe you say something and then the way somebody will interpret it you will be like is it the same thing that i said or is it another thing or the way you say something, you ask yourself that did this person really think before saying this thing? Or is this person just excited to use the mouth that God has given him or her? There are some people who they never see anything good. They never they all the only time they open their mouth is to criticize. There are some people who they are never ready to do anything. The only time that they are ready to do something is when everybody is failing. They join the masses to condemn those who are failing. But we are not the first people to exhibit this kind of character traits. There are people in Bible days who also had different temperaments. But if God was able to use them, then God is also able to use us. Because God is the same. <clears throat> Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. We look at the four different major temperaments. You have sanguine. Somebody who is a sanguine, is somebody who is enthusiastic, is somebody who is active, is somebody who is social. And a very good example of a sanguine person in the Bible is Peter, the disciple. You discover that Peter was a fisherman and by virtue of his profession, he was bound to meet people on a daily basis. When he goes to fish, he comes, he has to sell his fish. So he had to be lively, he had to be social, he had to be friendly, he had to be down to earth he had to be nice he had to be aware of what was happening in town and so when peter gets into the story of jesus 
This same sanguine nature still follows him. This same sanguine nature makes him to cut off the ear of the high priest servant Marcus. This same Peter, because of his social nature, because of his entire his active nature, he followed Jesus when all the other disciples had taken off. But you discover that even after following Jesus, Peter in his weakness, he denied Christ. But did Peter deny Christ and leave it there? Not at all. Peter went and asked for forgiveness. Peter cried for mercy. Peter made amends. Peter repented. Peter made it right with God. The difference between Peter and Judah is the fact that Peter took the time, took the pains to apologize. He showed remorse. How many of us today in the church of Christ are as remorseful as Peter? Some of us, we know it all. It is only our own that is correct. If we don't put our mouth inside, then the sentence is incomplete. Some of us are too knowing to a point where God is even, uh, uh, in fact, confused if to advise us or if to leave us. When we hurt people, when we offend others, when we step on other people's toes, do we make amends? Or do we continue our lives and say, ah, we don't give a damn? What is that thing that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of? That you have hurt this sister, you have hurt this brother, I have trampled on this person, I have offended this person, consciously and unconsciously, and we are, giving a, we are not giving a damn. We are saying that, no, we are in salvation's race. We are a new creature in Christ. The newness of the creature in Christ is not in how big we, our Bibles are or in how long our dresses are but in how the world is able to see a visible difference in this person who did not used to apologize before, who now apologizes, who now makes amends. This is a very fearful Peter. This is a hot-tempered Peter. Eh? This is a Peter who was ready to defend Jesus at all costs. When he had an encounter, after the, th the, the transition had taken place in his life, if you look at Acts, Chapter 2, Peter is able to stand up. Acts 2, 14, Peter stands up and declares boldly to a point where 3,000 people are baptized. That is where the well is able to see the newness of the Christ that we preach in us. That is where the well is able to see that truly if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And behold, all things have passed away. All things have not passed away that you have, be, you have had a different face or that you have had a different, I don't know, physical structure. No. All things have passed away in, their, in your, your opinions, in your behavior, in your perception of life, in your actions, in your reactions. That is where the world will say, if this person can change, then every other person can change. The next group of temperamental people are the choleric guys. The guys whom before you even say anything, they have already fled. They are short-tempered. They are easily angered. When you are dealing with a choleric person, you really need to be careful how you construct your sentence because the least mistake you make, they can use their fist, they can react violently. And a very good example of a choleric person is Moses. Moses in the book of Exodus on one day when he was trolling could not understand why a, an Egyptian would just do anyhow misbehave with an Israelite. The choleric nature in him could not allow him to, to, to turn a blind eye. And before he knew what he, what he was doing, he had become a murderer, like a joke. The next day when he saw two people fighting, the choleric nature in him could not still allow him to pass. He had to stop and ask questions and be the mediator because these two people, they concerned him directly. Some of us as parents, we are choleric. Before our children finish the sentence, we have already, you know, as siblings, as leaders, as, as, as Christians, as children of God, we are choleric. And this choleric nature is taking a toll on us. This choleric nature is being transformed into different different kinds of arguments, quarrels, misunderstanding. You hear two people raising their voices in church. You ask yourself where they have put the Jesus before raising their voices like that. Another choleric person in the Bible is Saul. 
Saul in the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 1. It is stated that Paul, Saul, before he became Paul, was the one who masterminded Stephen's stoning. He was taking care of the clothes of those who were actually taking the time to stone Stephen to a point where he went and took authorization to go and persecute the church. When somebody is a choleric person and the person stops at nothing to ensure that he or she meets her objective. But because God is God, because when we come to Christ, all things pass away. Because when we come to Christ, the spirit of God at work in us makes the difference. You discover that this Moses, this same fighter Moses, most choleric people are not, that they don't talk too much. And you discover that Saul, a, a, a Moses was a stammerer. And most stammerers, they use their hands. They don't have time to be explaining things. But after the burning bush experience, this same Moses in Numbers chapter 12, people are, people are talking anyhow to Moses. And Moses is still in the position to retaliate. He is even in a better position to retaliate now that he has the backing of God. But he does not retaliate. He leaves it and God fights on his behalf. How many of us have decided to help God because of our temperament? Before they even tell you something, you have fled like kerosene and fire. Before they even have the time to construct the sentence right, you are already fuming. But look at when we come to Christ, when there is a genuine encounter, when there is genuine transformation, you see a new Moses who instead of pleading that God should send down fire to destroy Miriam and Aaron, the Bible says Moses was the most humble man who lives or who lived. Moses is pleading on Miriam's behalf that God should have mercy. Look at the vigor with which Saul, turned Paul, preaches the gospel you discover that this same choleric nature, this same vigorous nature is what the Lord uses for kingdom advancement to a point where Paul can say, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. Paul was preaching the gospel unapologetically because his choleric, his, his fast, rapid nature was the same nature that he was using to preach the gospel of Christ. Are we new creations only on Sunday mornings? Or are we new creations? Are we visibly different in the way we live our lives now that we say that we are in Christ? You look at the next group of temperamental people, the melancholics. These are people who analyze everything. Their pastor's message today, he made a grammatical error. He did not construct this sentence before. The choleric, the melancholic people don't talk much. They think too much. And those kind of people easily harbor unforgiveness. Because they don't share their thoughts. Because they don't share their opinions. Because they don't share, oh, they don't know how to say, oh, you hurt me. You, 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 you stepped on, on my toes or you did something that they keep it and it nurses and nurses before too long it bears fruit. They forget that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. To a melancholic person, vengeance is his or hers and he or she will repay. A good example of a melancholic person is Thomas. Since Thomas was the kind of person who was very analytical, when the disciples, the apostles, they told him that we have seen Christ, Christ has appeared to us, Thomas said, no way. Till I see, I cannot believe. And it is difficult for this kind of melancholics to genuinely come to Christ because they want to see proof. They want to see evidence. They want to be sure. They want to be convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that this thing is not a myth. It's not a, 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 a film. It is the reality. But when these melancholics succeed to come to Christ, oh, they are so deeply rooted in their belief that it is hard to, to, to change their minds. Is there a difference in we who are melancholics or we who were melancholics before we came to Christ and now that we are in Christ? Do we easily let go? Do we use our wisdom, our quiet nature to further the gospel? to analyze the, the word of God in order to preach so that others can be as saved as we are. Is there a remarkable difference in the us of before and in the us of now? You discover that the next group of people, the temperamental group of people, 
is a phlegmatic people. This kind of people are relaxed. They are peaceful. They are easygoing. And as they are easygoing like that, every kind of doctrine sways them. On Monday, they say Jesus is the Son of God. They accept. On Tuesday, maybe Jesus is not the Son of God. They accept. On Wednesday, it looks as if Jesus, in fact, they are in the middle. They accept. And you see, when you have this kind of people, this kind of easygoing people in church, sometimes it's complicated because at the end of the day, they are not grounded. They are not rooted in the world. Any wind blows them. They are, they are not the kind of people who study to show themselves approved. They are not the kind of people who bother to work their salvation, work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Anything goes for them. If today they say alcohol is not good, they say, okay, we accept. Tomorrow they say alcohol is good, okay, we still accept. And a very good example of this kind of phlegmatic people is Abraham. God had given Abraham a call. Abraham had answered the phone call and the network was disturbing along the line because the network was not going the way they planned. And because Sarah came with a suggestion, Abraham did not go back to the same God who gave him the call. Abraham wanted to make his wife happy. And most of us are not very different today because in a bid to please man, we end up displeasing God and opening the doors of Ishmael's in our lives to a point where we forget that these Ishmael's come with long-term consequences. But you discover that after the coming of Ishmael, Abraham decided to make up his mind and follow God till the end. After the Ishmael mistake, Abraham does not make any other mistake. You discover that before Ishmael, there have been a series of lies. There have been a series of small, small issues. But after he makes the mistake of Ishmael, till Abraham dies, there is no mistake. It means as he came to Christ, there was that encounter, there was that firmness, there was that conviction, there was that steadfastness that I'm no longer waving. I am standing my grounds for God. How many of us are standing our grounds for God today? How many of us are saying that I am for Jesus, come with me? How many of us are saying that whether the, 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 the tides, the, the storm, the rain, the whatever is falling, I will cling to the word that God has given me? regardless of what I see in the physical. Didn't Job say, though my outer man may perish, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he will arise even at the last. Are we the kind of people who are still exhibiting characteristics of our old self when every day we are singing that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Look at the examples of Mary Magdalene, of Rahab, of the woman at the well. They all came with their old nature. But after the encounter with Christ, Mary Madeleine so walked for Jesus to a point where she was the first person to see the resurrected Jesus. Rahab, the rejected Rahab, so did her best for the spies to a point where it was now Rahab who brought salvation to her family. Are we talking about the woman at the well? Jesus used her and turned her from a prostitute to the latest evangelist in town. That is what happens when we come to Christ and have an encounter, a one-on-one -on -one fellowship with God, that fellowship that changes our mindset, changes our perception of life and causes the world to see that truly this one is of Christ. If you read the story of Stephen in the book of Acts, it, Stephen never opened his mouth to say anything to the people. The people saw in him the glory of Christ. What is that thing that is still giving us our own nature? That is making the world unable to say clearly whether we are new creatures or not. It is good for us to get it right. Because the Bible says in Galatians 4.19 that we need to walk and walk and walk till the image of Christ is fully formed in us. That thing that is destroying or distorting the image of Christ in you, in me, it is time for us to get rid of it. It is time for us to go to the place of prayer and say, Lord, this is how I am or this is how I was when I came to you. But I don't want to remain like this. I want to become the person whom you have destined for me to be so that the world will say, indeed, this one is a new creation. May God help us not only to be new creations on Sundays or theoretically, but to be new creations on a daily basis in Jesus' name.
May God bless his word in Jesus' name. Amen.